I work in a couple different areas of development. Uh, all of them span what we call uh, middle childhood, so kind of late preschool to early um, um, elementary age, around ages three to seven or eight. That's a time of a lot of transition uh, in terms of cognitive development, social development, and biological development. And there's a confluence of those three things that produce some really interesting things if you're a forensic psychologist. So uh, I'm just gonna share with you a really tiny aspect of uh, what is done in my lab. And uh, these guys over here, Kayla and Michael, uh, sometimes hang out in the lab and they do some of the experiments uh, that I'll be talking about. So let's start with um, when anyone, not just a child, but anyone says something that's not correct, there's one of two mechanisms that you already at least intuitively know about. One of them is they're lying. They've told you something that's not true and they know they've told you something that's not true and there's various motives, of course. They're protecting a loved one, they're trying to gain rewards, they're avoiding embarrassment or punishment et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one mechanism that leads people to give you a false report. But there's another mechanism, and that is they're telling you something that they actually believe is true, but they're wrong. It's actually a false memory. And that's really what my lab specializes in. We do some lie research, but most of what we do is what we call false belief, or if it's really detailed, false memory. And we look at factors that influence the creation and sustenance of false memories over time, why some kids are a little more vulnerable to false memories than others. So let me just give you uh, the typical auditory and visual uh, paradigms to look at this. So in one, we'll get parents' permission to call them at home and ask to talk to their four-year-old, for example. And the parents say, sure, you can do that. So we call one evening after dinner, and the parent says to the four-year-old, uh, Taylor, um, someone wants to talk to you. So they put Taylor on the phone, and we have, uh, for example, a male talk to Taylor for a couple of minutes. They say to Taylor things like, uh, what did you do at preschool today? Did you have a snack? What was a snack? Did you have a nap? Did you go outside and play, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, who are your, your favorite friends, and so on. So it lasts a couple minutes. And then the very next morning, the parents bring Taylor into the lab. And Taylor's told, listen, uh, Taylor, you remember that man who called you on the phone last night? And he said, yeah. He said, okay, we're gonna play some voices for you. And his voice may or may not be one of these voices. Listen to them carefully, and tell us if any of these voices is the voice of the man who called last night. And so we give them five voices, and it's a blank lineup. None of them is the voice of the man who called. And if it's a fair voice parade, the, the, if the child makes a mistake, they're equally likely to pick any one of the five voices. And you can see the, the 0.2 probability if it's a fair voice parade there. They'll pick any one of the five equally often. And I, I might note that with young kids, even though you emphasize his voice may not be one of them, they feel almost compelled to pick a voice. They feel like you wouldn't be asking them to listen to these voices or to look at these pictures if the real caller wasn't one of them. So no matter how much we and others warn the children, uh, the uh, false alarm rate is very high. It's usually around, point, it's usually around 70% that they'll pick a person out of a lineup even though that person's not in it. So okay, no big deal. Parents bring Taylor back a couple days later. It's now the third day since the uh, evening telephone call and they're given the same instructions. We're going to play five voices. The caller's voice may or may not be one of them. Listen carefully and tell us if any of these is the caller's voice. And now we do something a little bit different. We give them four brand new voices but the fifth voice is one of the five from a couple days before. It's not the caller's voice, it's one of the five from the blank voice parade. So you got four brand new voices and this repeating voice, and you can see what happens now. They say the repeating voice is the caller's voice. That's the man who called me. And they'll say that around 35 to 40% of the time. So 
you know, chance the day after the call is 20%, but now when you use the repeat, it's, it's jumped up quite a lot. And then Taylor's parents bring them back a couple days later. It's now five days since the evening call. They're given four brand new voices, and we keep sticking this repeat voice in, and that repeat voice is very familiar to them now, and they claim that's the caller's voice, and they're picking them 55, 60% of the time. They're saying, that's the man's voice who I talked to on the phone. And here you can see what happens if you bring them back two weeks later, and now you do this neat thing. You give them three brand new voices. You give them this repeat voice as the fourth. And what's the fifth voice? The actual caller. You guys are all budding psychologists. And what happens is you can see here, they're picking the repeat voice over the actual caller because it's more familiar now. And all these other things here are methodological controls to show that that's driven by how many times they heard it. It's not driven by the length of time. For example, over here, if you just have someone call a kid and then you wait two weeks and you give them a, a blank voice parade, even two weeks later, they're picking any one of the five voices equally often. If you repeat it once and then don't do it again until two weeks, they're up around you know, 25, 30%. If you do it twice, they're up here. So it's really a linear function of how many times they've heard this repeating voice. It's not due to just the sheer passage of time, for example. So anyway, that's called an auditory source misattribution. Fancy phrase, it just means that something's familiar, but you misattribute the source of its familiarity. It's familiar because you've heard it three or four times, but you misattribute it and say, it's familiar because that's the man who called me. And one of the things that happens, and this is devilishly difficult for preschool age kids, it's, it's hard for all of us, but it's disproportionately hard for, for young kids, is they lose source information from the memory trace faster than perceptual information, faster than the way something looks or sounds. You, you tend to retain that perceptual information much longer than the source, that is, where did I see or hear that? You lose that source information. It fades from the memory record much faster than the actual perceptual information. And with preschool kids, fastest of all. They lose that source information, but they're still retaining all that perceptual information. So lots of familiar stuff to them, they misattribute why it's it's familiar. And you can do the same kind of thing you see here with visual information. And here, I'm not going to play you the video, but one of the doctoral students uh, in our laboratory, Kaisa Royer, uh, made a video. It's, it's a fairly short video, and it involves a theft. And you can see this shady looking uh, woman over here. Um, who's about to steal a laptop computer out of this guy's uh, backpack. And so anyway, this video unfolds and people watch it. And then they're brought back and they're shown uh, initially uh, uh, a, a, a face parade. And uh, the photo parade is just like the voice parade. You can play games with all kinds of permutations. You can give them a blank one where none of the faces is the thieves uh, thief's face, and then you can bring them back a couple days later, and you give them uh, four brand new faces, and you can stick a repeat face in, you keep doing that until after two weeks, you give them free, three brand new faces, a repeat face, and the actual thief's face, and you'll create um, a visual source misattribution, very same way. So this is the principle involved in a lot of the research we do especially that age group I mentioned, three to around seven or eight, you see tremendous development in resistance of source misattributions. It's not the case that seven and eight-year-olds are great at it. In fact, you and I are not great at it, but they're a lot better than three and four-year-olds. Uh, I don't know if I have some data here to show you or not on that, but if I, if I do, I'll show you. Um, so at one point in time, my colleague Maggie Bruck at Johns Hopkins University and I wrote a book that summarized all the research we had been doing here at Cornell and at Johns Hopkins, as well as other people all over the world um, that has been doing this kind of research. And the book, as you can see, was called Jeopardy in the Courtroom. 
uh, a scientific analysis of children's testimony. And prior to the publication of this book, uh, I, you know, I, I pretty much uh, had a fairly uh, quiet existence here at Cornell in the sense that uh, I wasn't bombarded by judges and attorneys. But after the book came out, I started getting lots and lots of calls, mail, later email um, from judges, uh, uh, attorneys that were defending people, men, occasionally women that were in prison, uh, allegedly uh, falsely imprisoned, and so on. So these are the kind of um, emails that I get. And I'm just going to show you two of these um, to give you an idea because they, they span the, the, um, the most common is child sexual abuse. It might be a man in prison writing to me uh, claiming he was falsely uh, accused, convicted, and imprisoned of child sexual abuse. Sometimes they're civil suits having to do with uh, a bitter custody dispute. Uh, sometimes they're homicide cases. So here's a, here's a homicide case. I don't know if you can read that. Uh, Professor Lisa, I'm seeking a consultant to serve as an expert witness in a capital case. I need expertise in challenging the admissibility and reliability of statements purportedly made by a um, child victim witness. The case is set for trial in January, blah, blah, blah. I represent a 42-year-old African-American male accused of beating to death a woman, uh, initials LB, with whom he lived and her five-year-old son. Uh, her three-year-old, 10-month-old son, PT, was also severely beaten, but he survived uh, the state seeking my client's death as punishment. And the attorney goes on to describe um, the course of events when PT came out of a coma. He was in the hospital for uh, a long time. Nurses talked to him. Interviewers interviewed him. Uh, he said different things at different times. Um, he referred to the defendant uh, by his nickname and his initials, uh, which allegedly wasn't how he usually referred to him. And uh, the attorney goes on and on and on and describes how he later picked a mugshot out of a um, face parade and um, how many times they had shown him the face parade and, and so on and so forth. And um, concludes by asking if I would agree to be uh, an expert witness in the case. So um, here's another one, uh, looking for an expert to help in a capital hearing. Uh, client convicted years ago, so there's no requirement to interview any witness. This is an evidentiary hearing on a post-conviction motion. Uh, major issue is um, the only eyewitness to the homicides, a four-year-old. And this was a case where this little boy, <coughs> he was in the back kitchen area of his house and there's a screened in back porch. And he just happened to be looking through the screen door one day and there was this commotion in the woods behind his house. And three men were running and two of them were police officers. And the third was uh, um, a person fleeing the police officers. And they tackled him right behind the house. And this four-year-old allegedly was the only witness to this because the man fleeing rested the, one of the officer's guns and shot and killed both police officers. So he was on death row. And the four-year-old is the only witness to the, to the uh, murders. And uh, it all got down to how many times he was interviewed, how he was interviewed, what kinds of uh, suggestive techniques were used, and so on. And so I occasionally get this kind of uh, letter. And um, yeah, I won't go through that. So at any rate, um, my lab looks at how you can cause kids to say something happened that in fact did not happen. And there's lots of ways that you can do that. Um, there's lots of automatic things, uh, auto-suggestions that happen in the brains of all of us, but especially uh, young kids. There are certain suggestive ways you can interview kids, leading questions, uh, imagery inductions, and these kinds of things. There's uh, stereotypes and um, expectancies that if an interviewer has them can lead kids to make false uh, reports. There are visual techniques that uh, put kids at risk for uh, making false identifications. If an interviewer has, and I think in, you guys are using David Meyer's book and he probably talks about confirmatory bias, right? 
So, okay, if an interviewer has a confirmatory bias, this can lead to false reports. We've done a number of experiments in the lab showing this. Um, if the interviewer does this, something really basic, like reward kids for saying things that the interviewer wants to hear, or subtly punishes kids for saying things the interviewer doesn't want to hear. And you, do, and you see this in, in videos of interviews where the interviewer will smile when the kid says what she wants to hear and says things like, oh, you're so smart, uh, or you're so brave. Uh, it didn't scare you, did it, when he did that? Or punishes kids subtly by saying, oh, come on, put your thinking cap on. I know you can do better than that. You're smarter than that. So using just simple reinforcement and punishment techniques can shape kids to give uh, false testimony. Kids overhearing conversations of their parents on the telephone, other kids on, on the playground and so on, can also cause uh, source misattributions of the kind uh, I talked about. And finally, if you put kids under a lot of stress, they make more source misattributions. And then there's forced confabulation, which means a kid keeps saying to you, I don't remember. And you say, well, well, how do you think it might happen if you had to guess? And you, you sort of force a kid to give an answer. And once you give an answer like that, then later, you know what happens? A lot of times the kid, when a new person asks them, they repeat the guess that they had given because it's familiar, but they don't remember why it's familiar. Um, we have in the Department of Human Development at Cornell, in conjunction with the Cornell Law School, uh, a doctoral program, and Michael is in it, um, and the students in it come and they spend two years in the Department of Human Development. This is after they've graduated from college, and they get a master's degree in human development. Then they segue to the law school, and they spend two and a half years there, and they get a JD. They become an attorney. Then they come back to human development for two years, and they complete their PhD. So they get, end up with doctorates in both law and developmental psychology. And so that's a fairly new program, and it's a small program. We only take like one or two um, graduate students a year for that, for that program. And this is not something that you guys would be thinking about until after you go to college and are nearing the end of college, and you think you might want to be a forensic psychologist, or you might want to be a professor that works at the interface of psychology and the law. At the undergraduate level, the Department of Human Development has an area of concentration that you can have sort of a mini minor in the area of psychology and the law. Okay, any uh, questions?